Well, uh, we have been familiar with many works by Professor Shen, which were which carried incisive analysis of uh, the Indian economy as well as various social aspects including intellectual life and cultural life. Uh, but today we have been extremely privileged in uh, hearing from him a very personal account of his understanding of what this country was like and especially this city was like in the years of his youth in the 1950s uh, and towards the end of his talk today he hinted at a whole range of things that he feels where some changes have probably been for the better but there are many which raise concern even alarm so I'm sure there will be many of you who would want to ask Professor Shen to expand on some of those points. Uh, I will simply uh, misuse my privilege here uh, as chair uh, in asking two questions that came up. One from the earlier part of his lecture when he was speaking in particular about uh, life in Presidency College in the early 1950s. And he referred to the fact, and this was very well known even when I went to Presidency College a, a good uh, 12 or 13 years after Professor Shen, in the, in the middle 1960s. Uh, that Presidency College was a very elitist institution. And it was elitist not simply because the best students were got a chance to study there. It also had this sense of being elitist in a social way that in fact there it was seen to be dominated by students who came from relatively privileged families uh, possibly from the city of Calcutta uh, as I said that in the middle 1960s when we were in college as of course many of you know College Street became a, a place where there was a virtual civil war uh, and we certainly noticed and now looking back I'm quite sure that a certain social change was discernible by the 1960s because this was a time when students came into Presidency College not merely from a rural background but students who came from the refugee colonies from the various industrial suburbs and brought with them a politics which had arisen in those areas. They brought that politics with them. And this led to a very, very explosive situation as you, we all know through the late 1960s and into the early 1970s. So my first question to him would be his understanding of, of this social elitism of, of presidency college and, and connecting this to his argument later was the end he made this point that unlike Kerala West Bengal despite the fact that the left became a dominant political force for three decades uh, the question of education especially universal education never went as far as it did in Kerala uh, so therefore the question would be would you say that even though students from relatively underprivileged backgrounds were able to gain admission to Presidency College because of their excellence in, 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 in studies. There was a sense in which they got absorbed into a certain kind of elitist cultural formation. Uh, this is my, my first question. Uh, the second concerns uh, is your analysis of your relation to the Communist Party, uh, your reluctance to accept uh, party organization. And especially this very interesting discussion uh, you, you had uh, about the debates in the coffee house over the Soviet Union. Uh, and my question is, especially in relation to 
your, your, your conversations with Ronajit Guho. Uh, because one of the things I have noticed in my conversations with Ronajit Guho, with whom I have spent many hours talking about these, these topics, even today I think Ronajit Guho feels some kind of bewilderment in himself in trying to come to terms with that period when he was a very active member of the Communist Party. And he seems to ask himself how he could have, in a sense, been fooled while, while he was a, a member of the party, because that was the time when I'm sure he defended Stalin and all that was going on in the Soviet Union, even though many of the information that later he would find persuasive was already available. And so that's my question, uh, the second question. What do you think went into uh, your fellow students? Because we are not talking here of, uh, of beliefs that were held in, in a kind of mass. These were students who were otherwise well informed, uh, extremely intelligent, I'm sure, and yet reluctant to accept that something was wrong in the way in which history and politics was being presented to them by their party and they felt compelled to defend the party position. So those are the two questions and if we, would you like to no, respond to them first? Yeah, then no, we can, no, absolutely, I would like to. to the, uh, no, they are the such the terrific question. Um, I think elitism is a very complicated concept because it is at one level clear evil in leaving our people. It's evil because inequality is evil for the same reason. And there's no question that Presidency College was an elitist college. At another level, it has to be said that unless you, in fact, um, encourage um, some people who are privileged and have done rather extraordinary work to continue to do so more. Um, you also lose out on achievements that could come on the way. I mean, I, uh, I, I, uh, I think if I think of another college of mine in, in England, namely Trinity, which was for but for elitism, we wouldn't have had Newton and Bacon and and then Marvel and Tennyson and Byron and and Dryden and so on. Um, the the thing to do, of course, is to is to have a a kind of um, root of ending elitism while you are making use of the best side of it. And this is what to some extent happened in presidency college, not as much as we would have liked, I think. And, uh, you know, oddly enough, Marx had a lot of discussion on that subject. Uh, if you think about one reason why a lot of um, anti-Marxian thinker, by which I don't mean anti-communist, anti-Marxian thinker. Um, among the passages they hate most is Marx talking about the idiocy of village life. He would have none of it. Why? Because he simply didn't think it was rich enough. He wanted music, he wanted play, uh, he would like to enjoy a joke when a person after seeing Hamlet tells him that it was a lovely play, he enjoyed it, but he was full of quotations. Uh, when that is a level not only of recognizing something, but actually feeling somewhat superior. And his understanding was that world civilization would not to see if you think about the poetry that he liked so much, uh, without elitism. So I think 
you know, if you're in the business of university, I think you cannot take the view that you have no room for elitism at all. It's a very difficult question. I do not have an immediate answer, but the answer cannot be no elitism or just elitism, I think. Now, at a very basic level, I think the Bengal left um, failed very badly in not going, not only as far as the Kerala Communist Party, but as far as Rovindranath Tagore, who wanted basic education for everyone, literacy, and he didn't mean basic education by like Gandhiji, uh, learning to learning your literary thing through chakra or something, as Rovindranath put it, the chakra is an antiquated machine which generates only monotony and tiredness. Uh, I think the there are big failures in any elitism, and there are small failures in elitism. I would I would describe I would say that even the beginning of presidency college, two hundred years ago, was a elitist conception. There were natives, it was called Hindu college. There were Hindus and Christians and Muslims, and the Rosio, for example, and that. Elitism made a big contribution, and yet not to see how much deprivation they were subjecting the poor sections of the community to was a very big, very gigantic form of um, harmful elitist reasoning. I, I, I have to leave it there because I don't know more to go beyond that. Now, membership of the Communist Party, it's, by the way, my point wasn't that I couldn't add something as party organization. Uh, I certainly knew it was not for me. I couldn't, uh, 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 I couldn't carry a party discipline. I was closely associated with people who did. My biggest teacher, Maurice Dobb, was a member of the British Communist Party. And so was another very big teacher, Eric Hotswold. Uh, but they somehow, I mean, Eric, I, uh, Eric and I went through much of Europe once with me driving and he a passenger. And uh, I think uh, I was uh, uh, just married and then now Nita, my. Uh, my first wife also there. Uh, we discussed a lot of politics, but I couldn't get him to talk about this subject, the question that you asked him. And uh, he at one stage said, you know, if you ask me a question, I won't answer it with a falsehood. But I don't have to address all questions that you place in front of me. He thought, by and large, the Communist Party was doing more good than harm, and he would rather not face the question. I think he might have been mistaken in that. But um, that's the uh, territory we come to. Now, the contrast between Bengal and Kerala partly, I believe, connects with also the origin of the Communist Party. The Communist Party in Kerala came from anti-upper caste movement. It had some Christian background. It also had some support from the, the royal families of Travanco and Cochin. But the bulk of it came from um, anti-upper caste movement. And there, there was therefore ingrained class um, uh, um, dread there. The big push in the in the West Bengal Communist Party, to a great extent, came from the from what you, the British used to call the terrorists. They converted, and that was took of many of them. Where we not had some uh, beautiful writing on that subject too. Uh, 
I know in my family there were two communist members on my maternal side who stayed on in Bangladesh, uh, uh, Sen. He was a, he, uh, he was a uh, weird in the communist party. He never had any terrorist temptation. But uh, Jyoti Mohsen Gupta on my father's side, he was uh, captured by the, uh, the, the, the British for getting money or allegedly trying to get money by in the famous case of Dhaka train robbery so to pass it on to Chittagong for the quote-unquote terrorists. But then he went to jail and in the jail he ran it into Mudafur Ahmed who was the, one of the founders of the Communist Party. And it's one of the interesting letters is that I mean, he, basically, he gets converted by Mudafa and then reads a lot of Marx and, and finds that that's the way to think about it. And Mudafa Ahmed, when the Soviet Union came into the war on the Allied side and were treated as fine by the British, he wrote a letter trying to just him, I was then dying, he did die from tuberculosis and undernutrition. But, uh, and he said that you will be happy to know that Jyoti Mahesh Gupta is no longer uh, of the same conviction. He is a member of the, he is completely sympathetic to the communist cause and therefore the government need not have any fear from him. I found it very peculiar as a letter, but I can understand what it was because they were on the fighting on the same side. So I think there's a history behind it that there are other people more competent than me to tell us the story. But I think people's ability to tolerate differences uh, while they're a member of a party varies. To contrast, if uh, my big economics teacher was Maurice Dobb and Piero Schaffer, Piero Schaffer from Italy, uh, uh, associate of Gramsci would have none of that. In fact, even when he disagreed with Gramsci, he would write to Gramsci saying he couldn't agree with that. So I think it's somewhat temperamental. I don't blame them who accepted the, who must have in some ways known the lie that the, that the, um, that the whole trial uh, meant and um, make it a tolerable picture, yeah. Right, so we can have some questions, but I will need some help because I cannot identify uh, people out there. Professor Sun will take just a couple of questions. No, no, I have many questions, I have many. I have many. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind being questioned. He has time. I don't mind being answered either. Borimdu and Park to have the microphones. Uh, Just I have a gentleman. Yeah, uh, <coughs> I have a small query. I have a small query. Regarding the population strength of current Bengal, West Bengal, and Bangladesh, uh, roughly speaking, the Hindus are 70 percent and 30 percent. I can't hear you. Roughly speaking, West Bengal population, 70 percent Hindus and 30 percent Muslims. On the other hand, Bangladesh populations just less than 10% Hindus. Uh, what is the basic reason you think about? Oh, I'm not a demographer to be able to give you <laughs> a reason for that. What I would say, I, I recollect an incident. I got an honorary degree from Dhaka at one stage and I and I and I uh, went there, um, 
and I was, I asked someone, is this going to be a religious ceremony? And he said, no, no, not religious at all, completely secular. So I was very pleased about that. So it began, it began with two minutes of recital from the Quran, followed by two minutes of recital from Bhagavad Gita, then two minutes of recital from the Bible, and two minutes of recital of Dhammapadam. Now these other three communities together make about 9% as you were saying, the Hindus and and, uh, Buddhists and so on. But nevertheless they insist that it is a multi-religious secular country. I think there's something to acknowledge there rather than just dismiss it as some kind of a showmanship or regard that they can uh, somehow we face them falsely because they don't recognize the difficulty that we have with 30% Muslims. We have never had any difficulty with 30% Muslims, you know. Uh, and we have never had any difficulty with 70% Hindus either. And uh, I had a, my, uh, my grandfather, Kitty Wong Sen, uh, he had a book uh, which we are trying to reproduce called Hindu Muslim One Ejukta Sarana. He describes his elder brother who was uh, in, in their village from around. And he was a uh, very good conversationist. And in the evening he would often go in the, in the village to the uh, uh, to the um, um, house of the Qadi, who was actually uh, a, I mean, obviously a Muslim priest, but he was also uh, a good Adda fan. And they would have uh, hookah together every uh, in the evening. And then one day, it, it, my, uh, this is my, this is third hand. This is my grandfather to me and my grandfather's elder brother to him. So he said that they found a Hindu priest, I think called Chastity or something like that, I'm sorry, <laughs> and going past. So, so the Muslim priest asked him, saying, please come and join us. We are having a good session of hookah. It's a lovely tobacco. You would love it. To which this chastity guy said, I don't think I can join you because you are a Muslim priest and I am a Hindu priest. We are completely different. And I am not one that is going to keep company of yours. You have to recognize that you may have the ambition to have a hookah with me, but you will not succeed. To which the Muslim faith said, you have to really think again. You live as a Hindu priest by deceiving illiterate poor Hindus and you earn your income that way. I live by deceiving illiterate poor Muslims and earn my living that way. In fact, you should recognize we are exactly in the same business. Uh, sir, would you, uh, would you kindly compare? So to Where say, are you? Sir, oh, yeah. Sir, yeah. So the, uh, the huge success of the microcredit movement in Bangladesh, uh, which was started uh, by uh, Professor Muhammad movement? Yunus, microcredit. the microcredit, yeah, yeah, which was uh, obviously a huge success, and then uh, after that, uh, a, a huge effort was made to emulate it in in Bengal, particularly in South Bengal, by the Bandhan group, so to say. But unfortunately, 
it it was not as widespread no so so what i'm requesting you is uh, is is whether you could you could point out the the very basic reasons why it was not such a success in southern bengal yeah. or from i'm bengal not going bengal. to answer the question because it doesn't relate to my talk and uh, it's a very interesting question and perhaps some day when if you and i sit down together i won't be for hookah but for something else <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we can we can talk about that but you know i would say something which uh, west bengal people we i am mean, including me should think about indians in general also there was a time when bangladesh was behind us in many different ways 25 years ago they had 20% lower income than india now they have 50% lower income india has made big progress in income but that's all it had 3 years lower life expectancy now it has 3 years more it has higher child mortality now it has less it had um the fertility rate which was higher than that of india and of west bengal and now it way below that it, it had uh, girls education which was way below india and west bengal and now it is way higher you see in some ways they have overtaken and in almost look given the fact that uh, they have managed to keep that the communal uh, uh, monstrosity to which i referred at the end one way or another on the check uh, and in fact probably too severely executed a lot of people and you know, and and dealt with it quite hard but one result is that it's almost like life expectancy literacy mortality rate that it seems to have been behind india far less secular than say in in the in the in the east pakistan period than india was and now seems to be well ahead of it so in some ways it seems to have overtaken us in every respect but i'm peculiarly sensitive to the fact that it may be overtaking us in secularism as well Yes. What is your view about India's economic prosperity of our grandchildren? Of our grandchildren. Just like paraphrasing Keynes, I want to ask you the question. No, yeah, but I, what is the question? Uh, what is the economic prosperity of India for our grandchildren? For our grandchildren, I think you and I are going to sit down together <laughs> with a cup of tea <laughs> and answer that question. together okay that's the deal i'm not going to <laughs> speculate what would happen to our grandchildren at this time i have have a seven grandchildren very proud of that <laughs> uh sir expressing my humbleness to your prominence i want to ask you one little question yeah what is your current perception of poverty in the indian context and is is there any grand solution for alleviating or uh, uh, overcoming poverty yes i have written books on it you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know poverty has been removed across the world not by you know income growth but by creating human capability through education through healthcare and and social security and so on if we are dealing with a country which where education system is pretty uh, 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 neglected uh, i mean the the spots of good achievement like in kerala 
but the uh, and then if you have health care I mean health care is such a mess that even when there is something whereby rich people or relatively rich people can spend a lot of money maybe in a private hospital and compensated by the government and call we call that universal health care when the basic health care even immunization is neglected Bangladesh had 98 percent immunization we have 67 percent I think they are not hard it's not hard to see why we have really fallen behind and if you look within India in 19 if, if 50s are the decade I'm talking about here 60s I go to Delhi and this is the time when Kerala is beginning to change in 57 the Communist Party come to office in Kerala and while they already had a higher literacy they decided that they're going to do it in a massive way uh, I had the good fortune of coming to know uh, Namudrikbad quite well because he was kind enough to seek my uh, advice on a number of issues now there was this question can Kerala afford it? Well, the answer is if you think economically, it could, because both education and healthcare are very labor intensive. And if you are a poor economy, the wages are low too. So even though you don't have very much money to spend, you need relatively less money to spend if you are a poor country. So there are a lot of, you know, I, I'm in many ways a standard mainstream eco economist and it's one of the mainstream economist thing is to look at relative prices a bit so there was that and they said that I was in in Delhi school and then uh, I remember trying to take a petition around for signature I, I got I think one or two and the argument was that it couldn't afford it and it wouldn't work. Kerala was then either the second or the third poorest country in India. What happened in the NSS, National Central Survey, recently in the per capita expenditure, they don't do income, but it's very similar. Kerala turns out to be the richest of the all the states in India. What happened? Well, education happened. Healthcare happened. What is the what other countries made the biggest progress? Tamil Nadu again deeply involved with education and healthcare, and um, Himachal for this same reason. And so it's it's extraordinary that this has been so illustrated not only by theory, not only by international experience of Europe and America versus Asia and so on and within Asia uh, South Korea, Japan and, and so on versus Philippines uh, that it's amazing that we have not learned the lessons I'm delighted you asked the question uh, there's quite a well established literature on how not to do it and since we have followed, I mean, this applies to Congress too, uh, but even more. I mean, what Congress did badly, uh, I think the, the government that followed Congress immediately showed that it could be done even worse. <laughs> and so, um, uh, what can I say? I, I, I do believe that the uh, classical... I've never claimed, claimed any originality in my, my life. All the ones that I'm talking about are very well tried, well known uh, 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 thoughts. Adam Smith, Condorcet, they talked about education and healthcare. As we said, nothing increases the prospects of economic uh, advancement as much as raising the human ability to to read, to count, 
to be well and so on. These are all uh, mainstream. I mean, I, I'm influenced by Marx, but I claim to be also a mainstream economist. And this came, by the way, I mean, uh, uh, when I was making a syllabus here, I had no interest at all in neglecting mainstream economics. Because if you study and apply it with an open-mindedness, you can see what mainstream economics is not saying rather than what it is trying to say. I mean, the decline of India under the British rule, that was classic mainstream economics way of stifling an economy. As indeed Adam Smith said in no less than the wealth of Nathan. Oh, so this is just about your memoir. Uh, I just would like to know that throughout your journey from Cambridge, sorry, presidency to Cambridge, coming back to Jadapur and Coffee House, no women are mentioned. Never. What do you suggest? What? What do you suggest about women invisibility in your entire intellectual discussion? No, I'm sorry, I missed the joke. What was it? No, I'm talking about that in your journey throughout different institutions from presidency to Cambridge to Jadavpur and coffee house, no women are mentioned. So what do you suggest about women's invisibility in your intellectual discourse? Sorry, what, what, what exactly? <laughs> no women were mentioned. Oh, no women were mentioned. <laughs> you did mention Minakito. <laughs> well, they were. If you read my memoir, they are women, certainly. <laughs> but um, you know, uh, in those uh, in in uh, in the other four also, uh, we had uh, I had women colleagues. I didn't mention any men's name either. Uh, but um, the uh, it's. Uh, one of the oddities of, of uh, academic life is, especially in economics, is the preponderance of men. And that's not the credit of academia and certainly not credit of, edu uh, of economics education. Um, when I arrived in Cambridge, um, because of the, my association with left-wing students here, including Student Federation, the, in Cambridge, a lot of people in what is called the Socialist Club knew that I was coming. They had been told that I was coming and to watch out for me. And on arrival, I got letters of invitation to go and uh, join them, have drinks with them, and so on. And there were... Uh, uh, particularly one woman who played a big part in my life, dead their last now, Dorothy Weatherman. Uh, I went to uh, see her, I think on my first week, and she, um, and I had a kind of call with her on a cause that you would sympathize for the nature of the question. Because Dorothy Weatherman was a great sociologist, but uh, Weatherburn was not the name on which she was born. She married Max Cole and became Dorothy Cole, published something under that, and then became Dorothy Weatherburn because they married uh, Weatherburn and, and so on. And I remember asking her that, do you not think that it's a mistake for you to go on changing your name? And and, and she said, do you have a strong view on that? I said, I do have a strong view on that. And, um, she, and then after a little while she said, you know, there are more important issues to deal with than that. In one sense, yes. In another sense, no. We don't quite know what the gender division and even language deals with it. If you look at the sex-specific abortion of female children you, and divide India between two halves, you find that North and West have all 
much lower birth ratio of girls, which means clear evidence of sex specific abortion. But East and South don't. They are have figures in the European range. Not that they don't have gender inequality, they do, but not at that level. In Bangladesh have none. Now, to what is it connected with all the fact that if you look at the language group, the the West and the North comes from the Sorosani group. The Bengali Assamese Oriya come from the Sanskrit based Magadhi group and later Ardha Magadhi. And Ardha Magadhi dropped gender in 10th century. So is it connected with the fact that there is less sex specific abortion of female fetuses? I don't know. There are huge areas of work to be done. And I, if I were younger, I would uh, do research on this, which I have learned from my past experience. The best way of doing research is to identify an intelligent graduate student of yours and ask her or him to do the work. So by the time this work is completed, you are much more knowledgeable. So I would have liked to have done that. They, you see, the Southern is, after all, not Sanskrit group. That's very Tamil. The Sauraseni and the Magadhi split has an enormous demographic connection. It's a pure coincidence. I don't know. And so there are lots of things I don't know. And uh, if you read my um, uh, uh, memoir, you won't have to complain that women don't come into the story. But, fun? Sorry? So I can tell you what friend. In today's talk. Yes. Yeah. If you analyze every talk of mine and see how many women are mentioned, there may be some in which uh, quite a few are mentioned. Are you uh, 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 You see, I, I, no one can read my um, uh, memoir without knowing about John Robinson and uh, about uh, various people I was uh, friendly with, involved with. Uh, it so happened that in this Jadupur context they didn't figure. Uh, uh, it, it's not... Uh, I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> it seems to me <laughs> it's uh, sometimes uh, people uh, sometimes these spot uh, diagnoses are very useful <laughs> because they draw your attention to something. I fear in this case it's not. Professor Sen, जयश्रीराम उदाहरण दिए कलकार छवि देखे अबजार्भेशन चाहिए दिधा विभक्त कलकता जय श्रीराम बनम 
জয় বাংলা আপনার অবজারভেশন সেই ক্ষেত্রে দাঁড়িয়ে স্যার এখনকার সময় এই যে এখন একটা কমিউনাল ওয়েভ কমিউনালাইজেশন কিছুটা হয়েছে সব বিদগ্ধরা বলছেন আপনারা বলছেন আপনার পাশে স্যার বসে পার্থ চ্যাটার্জি বসে আছেন বলছেন সেক্ষেত্রে কি পঞ্চাশের দশক বা চল্লিশের শেষ দশকের সঙ্গে গ্রেট ক্যালকাটা ক্লিক নোয়াখালী ক্লিক সব করেই আপনার কথা এসছে আপনারা কোনো মিল পাচ্ছেন আমি মানে সংবাদ সংস্থার পক্ষ থেকে জিজ্ঞেস করছি হ্যাঁ আচ্ছা প্রথম প্রশ্নটা হচ্ছে যে ওই জয় শ্রীরাম যেটা বলছেন সেটা খুব প্রাচীন বাঙালি বক্তব্য এরকম শুনিনি অ্যাকচুয়ালি ইনফ্যাক্ট ওটা তো ইদানিংকার আমদানি সেই জন্যে ওটা ঠিক কোন জায়গায় পড়ে ওটা একটা লোককে ব্যবহার করতে হলে তাকে দিয়ে এইটা বলা আর তার যদি না বলতে পারে তাহলে বই মাত্র করা এইটা এইটা তো আমার চেনা বলে মনে হচ্ছে এখানে তাই এটাকে আমার ধারণা না যে বাঙালি সভ্যতার সঙ্গে একটা যোগ আছে যেমন রামনবমী রামনবমী এখন শুনছি নাকি খুব কলকাতায় হচ্ছে এটা এটা আগে হয়েছে বলে শুনিনি আমার চার বছরে নাতনিকে সে এই কলকাতায় আছে তাকে আমি জিজ্ঞেস করলাম যে তোমার এই যে দেবদেবী দেখো তোমার তোমার কাকে পছন্দ হয় মতে তো তারপর অনেক চিন্তা করে বললো যে আমি বললো মা দুগ্রা এখন আমাদের দেশে মা দুগা বা মা দুর্গা যা প্রতিপত্তি তার সঙ্গে তো ঠিক এই এই রামনবমীর তুলনা করা যেতে পারে না এইগুলো হচ্ছে ইদানিং এসছে দ্রুত করার জন্য এসছে তো নাইনটিন ফর্টি যে বাইরে চলে আপনার প্রশ্ন এখন আসছে সেগুলো তো তখন ওই সময় বাইরে থেকে এসছে এবং এই নয় যে বাংলাদেশে কখনো রায়ত হয়নি কিন্তু এর মধ্যে যে একটা জোর গলায় পার্থক্য করার চেষ্টা সেটা তো কখনো ছিল না এই যে গোয়িং ব্যাক অল্প চন্ডীমঙ্গলেও যে ইতিহাস করছে আলোচনা করছে যে যে যখন মুসলমানরা প্রথমে এলেন যখন কোমস জলটা গঙ্গার জলটা রিডিস্ট্রিবিউটে ধরতে থাকলো এবং তারপরে যখন পর্দাটা বেড়ে গেল এবং তখন আবার জনসময় ঢোকায় ঢোকায় সেটেলমেন্ট হতে থাকলো ঢাকা ফরিদগঞ্জ ফরিদপুর ইত্যাদি তো এইগুলো যে সেই সময় চন্ডীমঙ্গলে যে লিখছেন যে এইরা কা করছেন এরা হচ্ছে খুব কর্মস লোক এসে তারা বন জঙ্গল পরিষ্কার করছেন এবং তার ফলে লোকের বসতি বাড়ছে এবং সবচেয়ে আমার ইন্টারেস্টিং দেখেছেন যেতে কি কোথা থেকে পেয়েছেন চন্ডীমঙ্গলের আমি ঠিক যায় না যে তারা এই যে মুসলমানরা এলো এটা তো মানে অধিকাংশ মুসলমানই তো বাংলাদেশে পশ্চিমবঙ্গে বাংলাদেশে কনভার্টেড এটা কিন্তু যারা এসে বিদেশ থেকে তারা এসে এখানে মার্কেট স্থাপন করলেন বাজার স্থাপন করলেন তারা ওটা নিয়ে এসছেন ওটা ওই মধ্য এশিয়া থেকে এর মধ্যে কিছু হিন্দ এখানে আছে কিন্তু আমার ধারণা না যে আমরা এমন একটা কিছু পাব এখানে যাতে এই একজাক্টলি একই যে তখনকার জিন্না যেগুলো ব্যবহার করেছেন এবং সময় সেই সময়কার আমাদের সময় তো তখন হিন্দু মহাসভা রাধা দেন বিজেপি 
তারা যে একটা ভারতে তাদের স্লোগানও তো অন্যরকম ছিল এই স্লোগানের মধ্যে মিল হয়তো থাকবে না কিন্তু মোটিভেশনের মধ্যে মিল থাকবে বাইরে থেকে কিছু আনা বলে যে তোমাদের লয়ালটি ওই শ্রীরামের কথা কি বললেন শ্রীরাম কি জয় শ্রীরাম লয়ালটিতে হ্যাঁ ও আচ্ছা তে হ্যাঁ আমি এ বিষয়ে খুব অগ্রতা স্বীকার করছি আমার দেশে যেমন একটা হনুমান তো আমাদের তো এখন যদি হনুমান শুনি যে হনুমানকে সবাই খুব ভক্তি করছে সেটা তো ঠিক আমাদের ভাষাতেও এখন ওকে বলা হয় তো তুমি একটি হনুমান সেটা খুব সেটা খুব প্রশংসনীয় বলে মানে করা বোধায় হয় না সাধারণত যাত্রাতে যখন ইন্টারভাল হয় তখন হনুমান এলো তার লেজের থেকে লেজে লেগে বাসনপত্র পরে যেতে থাকলো এই এইটাই তো হচ্ছে গিয়ে একটা বাঙালি যাত্রা একটা ঐতিহ্য আপনি যে প্রশ্ন করেছেন যে কীরকম পার্থক্য আছে এটা ভাবার কথা এগ্রি করছি আপনার সঙ্গে I'm sure we have had a most memorable evening today with Professor Amurtu Shen. Uh, he was not here, but everybody else will remember the situation that prevailed in this auditorium before he arrived. And I'm sure you will agree with me that it was his sheer <laughs> presence and then his words which converted a very chaotic auditorium into one where this entire gathering heard him in fact heard him with rapt attention and pin drop silence so for this uh, as i said this will be a most memorable evening i'm sure many of us we'll talk about it to our grandchildren one day uh, <laughs> our thanks to professor shen and to the students of jadavpur university uh, who have been actually so exemplary in listening to him uh, we we now have a formal uh, vote of thanks from our registrar dr snehamun jubosho and i will request people to my left to please keep the door clear so that professor shen can leave once the formal vote of thanks is over so i register dr sneha monju washu good evening everybody it's really a great honor and privilege on my part to deliver the vote of thanks in presence of such an august audience on behalf of jadavpur university and the people of kolkata i would like to thank first and foremost professor amartya shen who so kindly accepted our invitation to speak on a subject that is close to all of our hearts he has said new light on the lives and times of this city and what it means to all of us we will remember this day with gratitude and pride for many years to come our heartfelt gratitude is also due to professor partho chatterjee who readily agreed to chair this very special event and made it so wonderfully interactive and inclusive for those of us who are fortunate to be present here today thank you so much sir my gratitude to mr kumar rana of the protichi trust an institute founded by professor shen who carried on the liaison with jadavpur university that enable us to create this very special occasion 
my thanks are also due to all my colleagues at jadavpur university especially our vice chancellor professor shuranjan das and our professor pro vice chancellor professor pradeep kumar ghosh our beloved students all my faculty members officers and staffs who work together as a team to ensure the success of today's event thanks are also due to the local administration and the policeman of jadavpur police station who work with us to keep things running smoothly finally let me say a big thank you to everyone in this warm and appreciated audience including those who watched professor sen's speech on the video fed outside this auditorium for their enthusiasm and encouragement thank you all once again thank you uh thank you very much and as uh, professor partho chatterjee partho das said thank you for being so peaceful kindly remain peaceful <laughs> for the next 5 minutes whilst uh, professor shen leaves Aap it has been a very na. busy day for him he arrived here yesterday and he will be uh, leaving the city tomorrow so i would request all of you to please remain where you are until professor amartya shen leaves the auditorium i have already been receiving requests for autographs and so on kindly excuse that because it will not be possible for him to give autographs to so many individuals oh, okay <laughs> i mean <Thank> you <laughs>